Okay, so um, uh, many of you have, uh, so I'm gonna, um, this might, some of this might be repetitive from the last meeting, but I see some uh, new faces, um, larger turnout uh, today, so uh, I do wanna go over uh, a few things, so apologize if it's, anything is repetitive. Um, but, uh, you know, the current department focus, you know, remains this, uh, maintaining and improving existing passenger rail corridors as opposed to expanding the new ones. And while that can be frustrating for some of us, um, hopefully you're going to see that um, some of the progress that we're making both in Wisconsin and in the Midwest um, is, is very important to uh, doing um, bigger and greater things in the future. Um, so uh, presentation uh, today is um, going to give a, a quick update on our program and planning update at WISDOT, um, an update from uh, Amtrak's perspective <coughs> briefly on the Empire Builder, and um, and then go into uh, the Midwest passenger rail improvements and implementation and the initiatives that are going on in the Midwest. Um, and then finally wrap up with the federal outlook. So uh, as all of you know, uh, Wisconsin State Supported Services, the Hiawatha Service, about a $5 million contract uh, that we have with Amtrak every year to operate that. And uh, we've been um, working hard to uh, um, make that as cost efficient as possible. Um, our state payments have been uh, stable or going down in recent years. That's thanks to increasing revenues. Um, so uh, it's very pos positive uh, progress there. And, uh, again, had seven round trips uh, daily uh, between Milwaukee and Chicago. So uh, ridership, we're at about 829,000 for fixed date fiscal year FY17, which closed uh, on June 30th. Uh, that's a 3.4% increase over 2016. You can see the trend on the right. Continuing a, a positive trend there over double ridership since we've been to uh, around the seven round trips. Over 95% on time performance. It's one of the best in the Amtrak system, if not the best, uh, for the Hiawatha service, uh, thanks to uh, Canadian Pacific Rail and um, Metra, the two most railroads, um, and Amtrak for, for really uh, uh, focusing on um, operations. Uh, state fiscal year FY17, um, we had 75% cost recovery ratio, 75% total cost recovered by. Um, several recent uh, Hiawatha service initiatives going on. Um, a new service, both on, on both concepts of the Hiawatha service, we have the new Siemens chargers. Uh, we did implement a schedule change last month with a new Friday late night train from Chicago, uh, departing Chicago at 11.25 p.m., going back to Milwaukee, and then restoring that early Saturday morning train, uh, uh, departing Milwaukee at 6.15, going back to um, Chicago. Um, that was a, uh, a popular train with students, and uh, there was a lot of feedback and desire to get that train back. So these two trains replaced these late, two late Saturday night trains um, that we had for about a year. Um, and those had replaced the, the two early morning Saturday trains, with one leaving Chicago at 6 and uh, the 6.15 a.m. from Milwaukee. But the two Saturday late night trains did better than those two Saturday early morning trains. Um, but um, we looked at this other option that we want to try out, and Amtrak felt it was uh, worth doing and forecasted higher ridership with this combination of the Friday late night train and Saturday early AM train. There's no net changes in the train slots that we have between Milwaukee and Chicago. Um, so no changes there. We didn't have to do um, anything infrastructure wise uh, to accommodate this. This is just a, um, a, a schedule switch. Um, we continue to have uh, promotions, buy one get one half off on Saturdays, the increased student discount to 15%, uh, kids ride free on summer weekends, we're looking at other periods of the year where we can do that. Um, we have a very robust uh, advertising program with uh, social media, um, online ads, um, uh, print, and uh, radio. Um, and um, I think you're, you're all familiar with the amenities that we had, uh, have added over the past few years. There, uh, we did implement a fare structure change to peak off-peak fares. Uh, again, we're not a reserve service, so we don't have Amp Amtrak's revenue management system where they can adjust the fares all the time. So we do have a, a peak and off-peak fare system uh, on weekdays. Um, and um, 
we have had some new Amtrak Thruway connections um, that I'll talk about in um, shortly. So I'm going to go into the, uh, actually, I, let me just uh, jump ahead here to the, to the uh, Thruway bus issue. Um, and then I'll go back to the, the studies. Um, just as a reminder, as you all know, that we did implement, uh, we're able to uh, work with uh, Amtrak um, and Badger and to get an Amtrak throughway connection to Madison um, with Badger bus, which goes right into Milwaukee Intermodal Station now. Um, so you can go on Amtrak.com, purchase a ticket from Madison to Chicago, uh, Madison to Milwaukee on Badger, and then a very easy connection in Milwaukee uh, to the Hiawatha service. So this, you know, it's we put a you know, big importance on these throughway connections. Um, it's important not to do a passenger rail route, as you all know, in a vacuum, both in terms of, of intermodal connection, the transportation system as a whole, um, and also in terms of you know, just focusing on one route as opposed to looking at it as a regional system, which I'll, well, I'll talk about uh, more in, in a few minutes. Um, so we have the Badger connection. We have the um, we are working with Amtrak now on beefing up the Green Bay uh, to Chicago throughway connection. Um, they've just uh, added a few uh, bus schedules to that. Uh, there's a uh, Friday and Sunday service that was operated by Lamers between Milwaukee and um, Green Bay. Um, that's been incorporated now into the Amtrak throughway system. So there's going to be more options uh, between Green Bay, Fox Cities, um, and, uh, and Chicago. Uh, via throughway bus and the Hiawatha service. Now, the uh, I know the big issue with um, a lot of people in this room right now is connections between Madison and the Empire Builder at, at Columbus. Um, this still remains a challenge. Um, it's a, it's a challenge uh, for Amtrak to be able to guarantee a connection um, when currently we have a, a, a one round trip bus route that goes from Madison to Green Bay that stops in Columbus. Um, and uh, one round trip Empire Builder. And so um, with, this, with the reliability issues of the eastbound Empire Builder, um, it's very difficult to guarantee a connection. Um, so really a dedicated uh, shuttle is what's needed. And uh, the issue there is how do we, how do we fund that? How do we, how do we implement that? Um, there's 5311, FTA 5311 inner city funds that we've looked at. Um, that provides a 50% match for operating, uh, but then we need the, the other 50% um, match. And, and the question is, where does that come from? Amtrak doesn't have a, a pool of funding dedicated uh, to this kind of thing. Um, so that, that remains a challenge, but we're still looking at options. And frankly, if anybody has any ideas on how to move this forward, uh, we'd be, we'd be uh, very interested. Um, let me jump. Uh, let, me, let me talk about the Empire Builder here too from uh, Amtrak. Um, so, um, Empire Builder um, performance um, year to date, the on time performance 59%. Not great. They got hit pretty bad for a few months in, um, I believe it was spring or early summer, which drove that down. But the September on time performance was at 90%. Uh, which is which is fantastic. So hopefully we, uh, that can continue. As you know, it varies. Um, ridership was just over 454,000 for the route for the federal fiscal year ending September 20th. That's about uh, uh, consistent with uh, last year's ridership, um, and it does remain the highest ridership long distance route. Um, other initiatives from Amtrak, you may have heard that they are um, their Amp fleet equipment, their single level equipment. They're doing a refresh of that. Um, that uh, a lot of cosmetic improvements to the, to the interiors of those trains, um, new seat cushions, uh, new wainscot, new bulkheads, and, and things like new lighting, et cetera. And we'll be seeing uh, hopefully some of those soon on the Hiawatha service. Th that work is being done um, right now. I'm going to flip back here now to, this, to the studies that uh, Wistot is involved with. So the, uh, an update on the Chicago-Milwaukee Intercity Passenger Rail Corridor Environmental Assessment Service Development Plan, 10 round trips, increasing the Hiawatha service to 10 round trips daily. Um, 
as you all know, it's a, it's a pretty uh, um, congested corridor, complex corridor, uh, up to 65 metric commuter rail trains, 25 freight trains, and 16 Amtrak da trains daily, and we uh, want to increase that to 22 Amtrak trains um, in the near term. Um, and that means there's over uh, $155 million in infrastructure needed uh, with the total capital cost when you add in potential for a need for new equipment of $200 million. Um, so just to, you know, the purpose of this is um, to address growing demand for rail service um, in the corridor and seating capacity issues on existing trains, but also to ad address broader issues in, the, in that um, uh, key corridor between Chicago and Milwaukee, um, and traffic congestion and other mobility issues and supporting economic development in the corridor. Um, we'll be improving schedule options, which will, which will uh, make more trips possible, um, and, uh, and facilitating uh, multimodal connections, both with inner city bus, flight connections at the airport. Um, when you look at the 10 round trip schedule, uh, not only does it add peak trains in each direction in the morning and the evening, but it also adds late night trains. And what those late night trains do is um, um, cause a significant percentage increase in the number of flight connections that we can make um, at Milwaukee uh, Airport. There's a block of flights right now that arrive at the airport um, in the evening, and we miss all of those with our last train departing Milwaukee Airport for Illinois at about 7.45 um, or so. So we miss a lot of those. Um, adding that uh, late night train from Milwaukee will be able to capture a lot of those flight connections, make um, single day round trip business trips um, possible for people in, in Northern Illinois, which is the big market for the Milwaukee airport. Uh, the objective of, the current, the, of, of this study that we're doing now, of course, is federal funding for final design and construction. So you can here see, I'm not gonna go into the gory details of all the infrastructure improvements needed, but um, there's three in Wisconsin, uh, one of which is a second platform at the airport, um, and uh, with the majority being in Metra territory in Illinois. So, uh, as you know, we had a draft of this uh, environmental document uh, completed last year, and a uh, public uh, comment period uh, from October, and we extended all the way through January, actually. Um, and uh, the results were, you know, for a round trip, uh, or a ridership, sorry, in the first year of 10 round trip service was approximately a million. Um, capital cost roughly 200 million. Um, and there will be additional operating uh, support required initially. Um, the public comments we received, there was strong support from Wisconsin stakeholders, thanks to WISARP for um, um, the, the letter and comments. Um, there was also strong support from the business community in Southeast Wisconsin and Illinois, including major uh, corporations. And this is actually, I think, important for, for everyone here is, is the, um, you know, we received a letter, uh, a comment letter um, from, uh, it was a single letter that had the uh, signatures and logos from several major corporations, uh, including Miller Coors, SC Johnson, um, uh, CNH Industrial, which is Case, um, and several, several others, those are just a few examples, and the, the power that that letter has had, and I've used it frequently, is, is very significant. So I would say the message here, in addition to what Tim was saying about the universities, um, reaching out to the uh, private sector is uh, very important uh, for, for these passenger rail initiatives. Um, opposition, uh, we did get a significant pushback and opposition from Illinois North Shore suburban communities due to some track projects. And there was concern about uh, freight, uh, rail, noise, and vibration uh, that, uh, you know, there's going to be, we're going to be building freight yards um, and, and things like that. So uh, that has been, we've been uh, doing additional um, environmental work right now to address some of those comments, um, additional outreach to those communities to help address those. Um, and that's the work that is underway now. Additional environmental work. We are doing some additional capacity modeling to model a design change that Metro wanted on one of the projects. Um, and uh, we should be wrapping that work up um, uh, early next year and uh, targeting early next year to submit a final EA to the FRA 
um, final EA and service development plan to the FRA early next year and hopefully receive a finding of no significant impact um, on the f during the first half of next year. So the other uh, study is the um, suck Second Empire Builder Frequency and um, you know just as a little background again um, looking at the existing Empire Builder between Milwaukee and the Twin Cities typically there's uh, over a hundred thousand riders annually which is similar to some one round trip Amtrak other uh, routes um, state corridors um, and most of the of the uh, on and offs in Wisconsin 70 percent are traveling to locations within the Milwaukee to Twin Cities corridor segment so people are trying to use it for regional service so Minnesota and Wisconsin requested Amtrak to do a feasibility study in 2015 that was completed it, was, it had favorable ridership and revenue projections again this is for a, a second train the, with the existing Empire Builder stations um, that would on a schedule that would complement uh, the Empire Builder um, and so the results of that um, after uh, we felt it was warranted to go into the next phase which was to move towards environmental uh, clearance and service development plan for this corridor uh, to make it eligible for federal funding. So that's what's going on right now, um, sort of in a two-step process. This is phase one that we're, we're doing right now. It's a MnDOT-led effort. It includes railroad capacity modeling, uh, concept engineering of uh, infrastructure improvements identified that would be needed to accommodate the additional trains, and uh, uh, estimating capital costs of those improvements, and starting the environment that's pre-NEPA that's the initial environmental activities needed for environmental clearance. Um, uh, so some of the work right now I I includes um, analysis of how this service would integrate with the Hiawatha service. Would it be an extension of one of the seven round trips? Would it be on top of the seven round trips? Um, and so, uh, uh, and again, um, this is sort of repeating what I just said um, on the last slide. Um, but the service alternatives and how they integrate with the Hiawatha service is extremely important. We want to uh, maintain the um, efficiency of the Hiawatha service as much as possible. Uh, so this phase of work, expected completion, is the end of this year. And um, we will be awaiting funding, hopefully uh, Minnesota funding, starting in 2018 to finish the environmental clearance and service development planning. Um, for this uh, service. And um, Tom Fiel is here from La Crosse Area Planning Committee. He's been uh, uh, very involved in this uh, and um, um, provided funding for this. And he was uh, um, good enough to host, uh, to, to help host the uh, <coughs> public, one of the public meetings we had in September or late August. There, was, there were two, one in St. Paul uh, and one in La Crosse. And um, I think the lacrosse room had capacity for about 50 uh, people. There was double that. 100 people showed up. They had to do the presentation uh, multiple times. There were uh, legislators, mayors, um, representatives of the business community, uh, media there. Uh, it was a fantastic turnout. And um, you can see the standing room only uh, room here. And thanks to Dave Muma from All Board Wisconsin for these photos. Um, and, and thanks, Tom. It was a very successful uh, public meeting. So now going into uh, the Midwest uh, activities. Um, the, the Midwest states are really doing a lot uh, in terms of uh, coordination, doing a lot of work together right now, um, building off of the Midwest Regional Rail Initiative um, and Midwest planning work that, that Tim spoke about. Um, and this is... Uh, this is just extremely important because I think, uh, you know, the success of what Michigan is doing right now with the Wolverine project and the increase in speeds, um, what we're doing now with the Hiawatha service, what Illinois is doing now uh, with uh, the St. Louis corridor um, is really important for the future of passenger rail in the region, uh, not just for existing services, but for future services. So. Um, Again, we definitely don't want to do it in a vacuum, looking at our individual routes. Uh, extremely important that we look at it regionally as part of a regional multimodal network, transportation network. Um, 
So I'm going to talk about uh, briefly the, the current planning uh, that's going on right now in the Midwest, uh, the FRA-led study, um, the Midwest uh, Passenger Rail Equipment Pool, the Mid, uh, Midwest Interstate Passenger Rail Compact. I won't go into too much detail on that. I think Tim spoke about that uh, briefly, and the, uh, uh, the Midwest State Routes Amtrak Branding Initiative. So the Midwest um, uh, planning, the FRA-led Midwest planning study um, is uh, in its final uh, stages, I think, right now. Uh, it's a long-term 30 to 40 year blueprint for high performance intercity passenger rail network in the Midwest. It sort of builds off the, mid build, builds off the Midwest Regional Rail Initiative in, in some respects, but also kind of is taking a fresh start with a, uh, a new uh, connect model, that, uh, a travel demand model that FRA is using. Um, it is a conceptual high-level high, high plan, um, and uh, it, it includes, um, you know, unlike the Midwest Regional Rail Initiative, which uh, uh, focused on 110-mile-an-hour um, service on existing rail corridors, shared-use freight corridors, um, this plan includes looking at core express routes, which are uh, greenfield dedicated high-speed corridors, uh, dedicated passenger corridors. Um, and I think how it would tie in with the Midwest Regional uh, Rail Initiative work is that, um, you know, that's, that would be uh, kind of an incremental step that would become a feeder network to a larger network. I think that's the concept that uh, um, is being looked at there. Um, so the FRA has held several planning workshops with states and stakeholders. The final workshop is going to be in December in Chicago. And anticipated completion for the plan is early 2018. And the Midwest uh, Regional uh, Rail Equipment Pool. Um, this is a, a joint procurement, as Tim mentioned, of equipment, which uh, would not have happened if not for the work, the years of um, <clears throat> working together with the Midwest states, the Midwest Regional Rail Initiative, um, and uh, it, it, it uh, which was really instrumental in getting in this grant, and I think uh, in all the grants in the Midwest, including the smaller grant that we got on the Hiawatha service for the Truesdale crossover, which is in large part, um, we have to thank that for our, our on-time performance um, and the, uh, the, the, the grants in Michigan that are making huge improvements on the Wolverine corridor in Illinois uh, and in Missouri. Um, so Illinois has procured locomotives on behalf of the Midwest states using federal funds and we, we the states entered into a multi-state ownership agreement uh, for new equipment, which is really an unprecedented that states coming together to actually and we're actually implementing something now we came together and we're for planning um, and and technical studies and and now we're actually have have a binding agreement to implement something thanks to the um, we we're able to do that thanks to the Midwest um, interstate compact which gives the legal and constitutional authority for the states to kind of come together and actually jointly own manage um, and maintain a fleet of equipment. Um, so 33 locomotives uh, coming into service now, 12 are now in Chicago. Uh, they've been leased to Amtrak for maintenance and operation during, during the warranty period. The plan is to go out with an RFP for maintenance um, for the period af for after the warranty period. Um, Amtrak will be eligible to uh, compete for that as well. Um, the Hiawatha service uh, now <clears throat> is equipped with two locomotives as of last week. So revenue service has started. Um, and um, also part of this grant was new coaches for the Midwest. And um, the quantity and timing of those are, are currently being ne negotiated, but I think news will be coming fairly soon, um, within a few months, uh, with more information on that. Um, I don't, unfortunately, have, don't have any information I can share on that right now. Um, but um, stay tuned for that. Uh, so about these locomotives, um, they're diesel electric uh, with a standardized design based on a na national spec. Um, they're capable of up to 125 miles an hour um, service. They're 16% more fuel efficient uh, than the current Amtrak locomotives. Uh, they have state-of-the-art um, aspects to them like LED lighting, regenerative braking, um, the Tier 4 emission standards percent improvement in um, emissions from the current locomotives, which is huge. 
Um, they're fully FRA and FTA Buy America compliant. Um, they have faster acceleration and deceleration than, um, than the current locomotives. We've seen about a two minute <coughs> gain um, initially on Hiawatha run times. Um, we're looking into seeing if we can translate that into any schedule reductions uh, in the future. Um, and they are designed for easier maintenance. So the other thing that um, the Midwest states are now doing is um, kind of this, the, the locomotives being, being delivered was kind of a spur to action to, to move this forward um, and try to uh, realize this Midwest regional, assist, regional rail system with what we have now uh, rather than waiting for anything else. We need to get started now and, and improving in uh, promoting and, uh, and coordinating our services uh, improved schedule, connect, improved connections that we already have, and and better better promote. So uh, this has resulted in uh, working with Amtrak in uh, in a new brand, a sub brand called Amtrak Midwest, and you'll see this on the locomotives, uh, and hopefully see this uh, a brand out soon um, in on the on the on the internet and um, on Amtrak.com uh, and elsewhere. Um, and so we're, you know, we're, we're really uh, uh, focusing on, on looking at promoting, for example, Milwaukee, Detroit. The Wolverine is going to have, a, have an improved, reduced schedule soon. <clears throat> I think a 20 minute, 30 minute reduction, 20 minute reduction in travel time. Um, and that, you know, they're working on the new schedule. <clears throat> we're trying to ensure that the Hiawatha schedules uh, match up with those so we can have some good robust connections to promote between Milwaukee and, and Detroit and Pontiac um, <clears throat> and, uh, and Milwaukee and St. Louis as the St. Louis schedule improves. We're going to see a schedule reduction there within the next um, half a year, I think. Um, <clears throat> so we're looking at promoting Milwaukee, Detroit, for example, two round trips daily, Milwaukee, St. Louis, three round trips daily. Those are just, you know, the connections that, that work out. Um, and uh, and also the the other corridors in the Midwest as well, and, and you know St. Louis to Detroit, um, et cetera. All, we're, we are all members. All the Midwest states are members of the Midwest Interstate Passenger Rail Compact, for which Tim has been the the chair. Um, uh, it's a nine a nine Midwest states, including Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Illinois, are members of of that compact. Um, the purposes are to promote, coordinate, and support passenger rail service improvements, <coughs> promote development and implementation of improvements and plans for inner city passenger rail service in the Midwest, um, coordinate and promote with Midwestern interests regarding passenger rail development and support state DOT's uh, passenger rail plans. Um, they recently conducted a survey <coughs> excuse me, of universities along Amtrak lines in the Midwest. Uh, the results of those are publicly available. so. Um, um, I think that was a, a very good study and um, pretty interesting, so hopefully you can check that out. Um, and most importantly, I think right now, at least for Wisconsin, is that MIPRC provides the legal framework for the states to jointly own equipment. Um, and uh, MIPRC is also participating in, the, in that FRA, FRA Midwest planning process. The quick update on, on other states. Uh, corridor plans and studies that are impacting Wisconsin communities. Of course, we have the Northern Lights Express, uh, Twin Cities to Dul Superior and Duluth, uh, four round trips daily at 90 miles per hour um, along the BNSF. That includes about 20 miles in Douglas County, uh, Wisconsin, and a station in Superior. Um, they have completed a uh, draft envirom uh, environmental assessment that was submitted to FRA. Uh, they've also completed the public comment period uh, this past spring and summer. And uh, um, they have uh, responded to comments and submitted to FRA um, uh, a final document. There's some uh, additional work that's going on to address some of the comments right now, um, but uh, that should be resolved soon. And hopefully uh, finding you no know, significant impact will come soon for that and will be eligible for federal funding. Uh, quick update on some other corridors, uh, Chicago, St. Louis, um, they are uh, uh, winding up uh, construction work on that corridor. 
Um, they're going to be looking at a 90 mile per hour schedule initially and ramping up uh, at some point to 110 mile an hour service. Um, so a lot of exciting things going on there. There's been new stations uh, opening up along the corridor. Uh, Chicago, Detroit, Pontiac, of course. I don't know, Tim, do you want to? Okay. And uh, Chicago to, to Quad uh, Cities, um, that is also moving forward. Illinois is working on that um, and working with the host railroads um, on that route. That's uh, a little bit uh, further behind than these other corridors. So federal outlook. Um, the FY18 uh, budget proposals in Congress um, from both committees um, have fully funded Amtrak and provided funding for most of the FAST Act programs that are eligible for passenger rail. So um, thanks uh, again, as uh, was said earlier, for all the um, work that was done by, by WISARP and others um, to, to help that happen. Contrary to the President's budget proposal, there it's, it's fully funded now. <clears throat> um, we're under a continuing resolution until December 8th, and then an FY18 appropriations bill um, will be needed. Uh, for FY17 um, funding, uh, there are, again, those FAST Act programs that have passenger rail eligibility um, are funded and uh, include the Consolidated Rail Infrastructure and Safety Program, $68 million available. The notice of funding availability will be coming out soon for that. Um, the State of Good Repair Program, which is $25 million, um, that will also be coming out soon. The catch on that one is that's for publicly owned um, <coughs> rail lines. That's focused on publicly owned rail lines. The Consolidated Rail Infrastructure and Safety Grant has the broadest eligibility for passenger rail improvements. Uh, and then there's the Restoration and Enhancement of Passenger Rail Service. <coughs> Uh, Ten million dollars available. The availability will be coming out soon for that. That was focused on restoring Gulf Coast service, <clears throat> but since that's not ready, I think uh, um, there'll be opportunity for other uh, routes to benefit from that. Uh, that provides operating support for the first three years of a restored or new um, passenger rail service. Uh, the Tiger program. Uh, $500 million uh, are available. Um, applications were due October 16th. Uh, and very importantly for the Hiawatha service, uh, METRA <coughs> has submitted an, a Tiger Grant application for work at Roundout, which covers a huge project as one of the, one of the $155 million projects um, at Roundout in uh, Illinois on METRA territory. It includes uh, a portion of, of third track, um, uh, double tracking on the Fox Lake subdivision to St. Mary's Road, um, reconfigure, signal reconfiguration um, at Roundout, and a new crossover at Lake Forest. So uh, it, very significant. Um, it really advances uh, the um, Hiawatha program forward and also improvements for Metra. So um, WISDOT did uh, submit a letter of support uh, for that Metra grant and uh, hopefully that goes well. Um, even if they don't get it, it's very good to have that project in the pipeline um, and uh, this pro the project on the radar screen nationally. Uh, and then the infra program, which is more freight focused, um, <clears throat> but can include passenger rail. Um, that notice of funding availability is out. Um, applications are due uh, next week, November 2nd. And, um, in the Chicago area, I think the 75th Street project is, is, uh, is going for an infra grant. Um, and uh, that's it. That's all I have uh, for now. And I think